Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. Thank you very much for, for coming in. Uh, I'm Lucien Clusi. I'm the returning officer on behalf of the city of Potaskwin. My other job there normally is the manager of legislative services. And to my left, we have uh, Dave Burgess, our city manager. We're going to tag team this a bit. I'm going to start off with a bit of a disclaimer piece. And we'll follow that up with a presentation. Uh, Dave will take it over, and then at some point, I'll deal with some of the more technical aspects of it a little bit. Uh, so what we are providing tonight is information that is not meant to be understood as legal advice. If you feel you need legal advice, then I would suggest that you retain same. Uh, you can also contact Alberta Municipal Affairs for any additional uh, advice that you uh, wish to seek, and uh, they would certainly be able to, uh, happy to help you. I'm also happy to help you again in my role as returning officer, so feel free to give me a call anytime you need so. Uh, the other thing is, is a little bit of a point disclaimer, is that uh, we will be subsequently broadcasting uh, this on our site, and so if you ask a question, although you will not be visually depicted, your voice will be, so therefore uh, that is possible that somebody may recognize your voice. Uh, if you wish, if you prefer, and you want to ask a question, but you don't wish to vocalize it, by all means, feel free to write it down. We can read the question out and, and address the answer for it. So if that's all okay, I will pass it on to my colleague. Thanks very much, and thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we, To be honest, you never know if there's going to be anybody that shows up, and that doesn't mean that there's not people interested in running, but not everybody necessarily feels comfortable in coming to a session like this. They sometimes want to keep it confidential. Uh, or don't want others seeing if they're interested in running. So there'll be other people, I'm sure, that will probably follow this on online, and that's great. Uh, the main thing is for us to offer this and to be open for any questions, and we always are open beyond this as well. So it's just really important to be helpful, uh, approachable, and just you know, just be uh, able to have a very positive uh, experience for anybody that's wanting to enter a race because it's not it's not something everybody does very often. So. Uh, I do want to just tell you too, we'll run through this in, in not really a formal process, uh, just trying to go over the basics, but we really want to be open for any questions that you have. So if you have some while we're doing it, go ahead and jump in. It's not like we're going to lose our way and not be able to continue. We've got these by slides, so it'll keep us on track. And maybe I'll just share with you as well, It's uh, I think it's kind of important to be able to tell you just from experience. Uh, what you can you can glean from. I have kind of a weird background in that I was in business, but then I was a councillor for four years and then mayor for eight years in the city of Brandon and then now city manager uh, for seven years. So it's kind of a mixed bag. So I guess I can kind of describe things that uh, can go by what I've experienced in history as far as the time frames that you've got, the experiences that you may be looking at, and even questioning what kind of time time frames that you're going to be involved as far as your lifestyle. And that's very important for you to know and be able to ask questions on. So hey, what we'll do is we'll just, uh -oh. well, this is audio? <laughs> oh, sorry. We're, just, we're, we're uh, just sorting out some, some technical bits. OK. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, maybe we'll just uh, start right away with the uh, Municipal Government Act. Of course, is uh, just now they're just refining that. Uh, but uh, that's something that uh, we have uh, the existing one, but can give you what we have of what's being proposed for the changes uh, coming forward, but that's really covering governance, uh, the funding, collaboration and planning, and that's really what all councils are all about. It's uh, providing uh, direction and leadership and policies. So that really essentially is what you're looking at. Your entire encompassing role is to provide leadership to the community through a group effort of council. Dave, have you been advised yet when those changes are going to kick in? I heard January 1st, then I've heard this fall. Yeah, it really, uh, we're expecting it will be January 1st. But I would be shocked if it was this fall. So, no, we've been watching and waiting for it, but it's not going to be any huge drastic changes, but it'll be helpful to, to be able to get that when it is finalized, and anybody on council will certainly be provided with that as well. So maybe what uh, jump into what council uh, does. Of course, you've got a seven member council. It's very important to know whether you're the mayor or a council member, you're one vote. Uh, of course, the mayor role is, is different. It's providing leadership to council, 
uh, providing, I guess, as far as presentation to other levels of government or other communities, that's really a role that the, the mayor takes on. But as far as the voting, everybody has a, a vote to, uh, that's worth the same amount. And it's important to know that you can't uh, just think that you're coming in with a, a, a single issue and you're going to get what you want. It's You've got to have, of course, three others to make a majority of four to be able to, to proceed forward with what you're wanting. So it's a collaborative type of effort in, in any council, and it's very important to have a respectful type of environment and respecting each other's opinions, and of course, not always agreeing with each other. And that's actually very healthy to have it that way. So really uh, just uh, as far as clarifying that it is leadership direction and policy that is being uh, put forward by council, the actual management uh, and direction of the organization is what I oversee. And my position, of course, is the only one that reports to council and is council's only employee. So information flows from council through me to the, uh, the organization. And in reverse, anything from the organization flows through the city manager back to council. So it's, it, you know, it doesn't mean that there's a complete stop sign on being able to get information talking to uh, individuals, but it's, it's, it's very much uh, more professional to have a, uh, in a way that everybody gets the same information. And that's, I think, something that uh, every council has experienced where that, if it's not that way, people feel left out on the information flow. So maybe thin enough, I can uh, talk on what the mayor does. I touched on that just briefly. Whenever you have, for example, a Mid-City Mayor's Caucus uh, getting together, in fact, uh, Mayor Bill and I were just at that just uh, last week. There's 22 cities that are in that mid-city uh, mayors and city manager uh, organization. And the mayor goes and represents the council. And of course, it's uh, there's no decision-making there, but it's working together with other organizations. That's one. You'll have other regional, uh, like northern mayors, that get together as well. When you're meeting with cabinet ministers or federal ministers, you're definitely wanting to have the mayor represent your council. And that can be sometimes uh, easy sometimes it can be difficult if you have a maybe a, a relationship with council that's not working quite cohesively but that definitely is the role of, of the mayor is to represent the organization uh, the council and also the city so it's a little different than what you have uh, for just the council position and of course you'll know that they'll run the council meetings be the chair uh, be able to uh, administer through the meetings and represent to the media as well uh, that's not to say that councillors can't be talking to the media or the, straight to the public, uh, but you do try and formalize that the message goes out to the, uh, the media through the spokesperson, which is the mayor. And you now I touched on council as a whole. Uh, you, you represent all residents. It's not a ward system, as you know. It's at large. Uh, so six members for the councillors will be elected. Last election, as you will remember, there was actually a tie for the last position so that uh, the sixth one so there was actually a draw out of a hat i believe was the way they do it yeah well, something like that so, uh, that's uh, but it's six people which is actually very good i've, I've had experience in the word system and in the at large and i gotta say that at large is in my mind the better way to go because then as a resident you're able to vote for all seven people that are on council and there and six members of council and that's that's very important if other if it's a ward system you're voting for who's running for mayor and you're only voting for one person and so it, to me i think it's actually a, a preference tony hey, just to get back to the mayor's role just for a second what's uh what's the protocol now as far as the mayor's involvement in committee appointments well actually still as far as what you have is a decision of all of council how you so each council when they get in have that approval process. So they can decide. Is that through just through the mayor or is it a collaborative? No, it can be a collaborative, but you can have certain aspects decided by your council that for a certain appointment, that it be at the discretion of the mayor. But that would be the board deciding if you delegate that responsibility to the mayor. So it may be in that case right now, but as a, board, a new council, you can end up changing that. Lucy, just what at what point? Um, there's an ex officio clause in the act that provides for the mayor and the chief elected official to be an ex officio member of every board committee. And uh, to my knowledge, they're not changing that. 
So there is still that, that relationship uh, that the mayor still has some access to other community supports through that ex officio clause. And just to, to add to that, anything by council, any action to be taken by the decision of council is either by a resolution or a bylaw. So it's not something where one or two or three council members can say, okay, I want this done, and you go to staff members or an organization. It has to be an act of council. So you can have somebody that's very passionate and even experienced council members can lose their way on this and they, they forget that it's not them that gets to decide that this is what we're gonna do for this organization or event. It has to be a decision of council. So for example, you know, I'll just pick on the one that we just dealt with yesterday uh, was the Treaty 6 uh, ceremony that's coming on the 25th of September. There was some ideas thrown around about adding this and adding that, but it was an expenditure. That has to be a decision of council, not just one or two that are on the committee. So that's one of those things you have to watch out for. And sometimes you just have to respectfully remind them that that's, that's great that you're going without council knowing about this. Uh, we've got to have that run by them first and make sure to go through a resolution or, or a bylaw. And on that note too, I'll just, and that can change how the new council decides to operate. What we have right now is uh, pre-planning training uh, type of meeting that we have every uh, day or every uh, afternoon before our council meeting. And that's a good way to get all of council together and deal with many issues, but it's only for guidance and for just bringing things to the council table. It's not supposed to be for deciding to spend 5,000 here or uh, doing so, some direction of the organization. That has to be done at the council table in front of the public, uh, not, not behind closed doors. So uh, it, it is something that's very important and very valuable in any organization that you end up having a chance to talk openly and kind of hash out uh, different effects that they have to deal with and give guidance to council, I'm sorry, to administration through myself. But it's, it's, it's very well done. It's not in camera. Those are just, they call it planning and training. It's not, we're not trying to get around the regulation, but it gives you a free flowing discussion. And so if you're saying, what, what can we, what do we need to bring uh, forward? What does council want to see happen to come to the council table? Uh, what do we need? What does administration need to do to try and make that happen? It's giving guidance, it's giving chance for open discussion of where you want to go. Uh, it's formulating your process. So it's not a decision-making process in camera. You That is when you step out of camera uh, or to go in camera to have uh, discussions that are of legal, labor, or law. Oops, no, I missed that. Legal, labor, and land. Land. And some Purchasing stuff. land. But they always say it's the three minutes. else. So of course, if you're talking about what you're wanting to uh, purchase a parcel of land for, you can't discuss that out in the open, talking about all the different uh, aspects because that's confidential. But when you come out of in camera and come back to your regular meeting, that's where you make the actual decision. So if you're saying we want to buy this for $100,000, that motion has to be made at in open council. So we don't do anything behind closed doors that uh, is a decision. So the pre-council session if you want to call it that that you're talking about. Is that open to the public in the press or not? No, it's not. That's it's not. So it's sort of pseudo account. Well it's it's just open discussions. Uh, but, and you know that each council can decide differently sure. if they want to handle that differently. But as it stands right now it's it's just solely with the city manager and of course any department head uh, or employee. So discussion yeah. And a lot of times it can be issues of just organization. So it's not a meeting. It's it's actually just a session discussing what's going on in the organization, what we want to try and achieve. So it's very it's more of a productive uh, uh, gathering, I guess you can call it, instead of a meeting. But yeah, go ahead, because it's quite a bit more strategic in, in its focus, and it will be uh, somewhat akin to having a regular strategic session, if you will, as opposed to leaving it all up to uh, you know two or three days in the year when we do the strategic retreat. So. Um, the, the, the idea of uh, in camera has a very specific connotation in the frame of the act where it specifies that your camera during a regular special council meeting, you'll be green meeting, and that you're going in camera to discuss something that falls under uh, one of, of uh, many um, uh, items of disclosure 
uh, under the uh, Freedom of Information Protection Privacy Act, Part Two, and um, and that uh, and there is a laundry list of what it can be about. It's not exhaustive, and it's not about everything. But uh, you know, the the, the land leader's advice summary. There are a few other things, but things like land negotiations, uh, personnel issues, uh, uh, legal advice. These are some of the mainstays of that type of session. And that has a very specific connotation when you say in Canada. The implication is, is that that's been something that's been called during the council meeting and has gone to, to, to the incorrect camera session. And then out of camera, the only motion being to come out of camera that can be made in camera. And then if there is a subsequent uh, motion that's made, that's made as part of the public record as David said. And as far as the whole process, something that's totally new to council meetings, that's something that we end up having sessions beforehand. Get, it's called orientation, showing you all that uh, it goes on in the city, bringing you up to date on how council meetings run. And of course, as you're into it, you, you'll get familiar with it. And we're there to help uh, guide that whole process. So it's not not daunting. It's it's something you just gain with experience. And it's uh, it's not something that you can fail at. It's just something that you get better at. Uh, so just to really kind of put it out there that we all are new at it when we get started. So. Uh, I think everybody's gone through that that has served on, on council. The time commitment is uh, next what I'd, uh, that I'd like to touch on. There's no set time limit for a councillor or a mayor for the city of Otasqua. It's not, not something that uh, any else, anybody else dictates. And by the way, when you're a councillor, you're not an employee of the mayor or the others. You're a representative that's been selected by, by the public, so you don't work for anybody else on council you're of course trying to work together but you're a representative all on your own so if you end up you know you could have it where you really don't put much time at all you've got to make your own judgment on that because you're going to be of course judged uh, come next election or even throughout the term by the public so i think it's your own feeling of what the responsible uh, amount to to be there there's uh, of course represent representing the city on committees at functions uh, say for example the chamber Luncheons, for example, you choose if you want to go to that or not. Uh, grand openings, for for example, or activities that are community activities. That's up to you to decide what you do or don't do. It's not like you have to report in and be judged by the rest of council or staff what you've been involved with. That's something I've seen every extreme. Some will say it's like 40 hours a week uh, for council or mayor, and there's just not a chance it should be. And you'll have others that I remember many many years ago a fellow that uh, the packages used to come with elastic around it it was never opened until the meeting was on so i don't think he spent much more time than the actual council meetings i, I wouldn't recommend that i really i think you want to be part of the community and that's why you're you're so interested and should be involved uh definitely there's uh, the mayor has a bigger time commitment uh, there's going to be much more uh, demands on on that person's time and I think representation at different uh, functions with the other levels of governments, with other uh, organizations or other the counties or cities. So it, it definitely has more. Out in the public, uh, you're going to be approached as a council member by the public. And again, you have to decide how you end up uh, handling that. Uh, you may have to say, uh, you know, here's my card uh, or vice versa, call you when, when we have time. But you're going to have that uh, where it's all, all of a sudden the book is opened and you're your public uh, public property in some ways and you have to just try and control that in a respectful manner too so that's that's something to get used to i'll tell you uh, in fact on that note my if we go shopping my wife would just say I'll, I'll meet you back here you know when we're ready to go and maybe text you and say hey i'm ready to go so you, you just kind of have to come to terms with what the changes are uh boards and committees i'll maybe touch on that uh we have quite a few different boards and committees that are all listed here uh it, we try and any any organization you try and work with individuals on what your interests are and try and put place you on things that also fit with your your work with your time you know availability uh, when those meetings are happening so that's something that the mayor usually is the one that works with the different council members and tries to figure out what uh, people can go on most of them are not overly intrusive on on time some may just meet three times a year or uh, just at a certain time of the year that they'll have it. Uh, it, it can be a lot heavier than that too, but you have to kind of ask questions about what the commitment is and what the what the records are of all the different uh, 
types of committees that you could be on. And that doesn't stay that way for all four years. You can work together on that and approach the mayor and say, hey, I'd like some time to go on these other couple of committees or whatever. And that's something that can be changed each year. Uh, that's by resolution that comes to council as well. I don't know if, Lucy, do you want to add anything on the, the board yeah. committees? Generally reviewed every, every once a year, but they can also be done as on a spot. Change can be done too sometime during the year if the need dictates it. So, uh, you know, sometimes that, that circumstance happens where somebody's been appointed to two committees, all of a sudden one committee is starting to change their schedule, and all of a sudden now they're in a conflict, they don't want to not represent the one body, so, you know, they don't want to wait till October to change it again, so it comes back to council, they end up appointing somebody else, kind of a thing. So, uh, but generally speaking, it's done at the organizational meeting every year or shortly thereafter. Great. Go ahead. What type of reporting requirements do you have specific to the case as elected officials? As far as reporting back to council? Yes. We have that at every meeting where we have reports uh, as part of the whole process on our council agenda. So are they verbal reports or written reports? Yeah, we prepared? have both. We can have both. But you said, yeah, Lucian, you know that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we take, we take a written report. And it may just be bullets of meetings you've been to. And then at the actual meeting, you might want to expand upon that and be given an opportunity to uh, sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word embellish because that's not the right word. But anyway, to expand upon what it is that you are, uh, it is if you have a particular item that you think you can But there again, it's council's decision. So the, the, what the current council is doing might not be what the next council wants to do. They could end up as a group deciding that they want to do a different uh, function. So yeah, that again, you can, well, thank you. <laughs> Sound from all the kids are getting coming through. Now I'll, I'll just touch on the renew, uh, remuneration, the pay uh, that you have for the work that you do and the time that you commit. And this one, I have to tell you right away, it's, it's very important because you have to be compensated for the time and effort that you put into this. If you have a business, for example, or uh, if you're working as a salesman, well, you're taking time away from earning your normal income. So you definitely want to be compensated for this. It, it can't be just uh, a, a gratuity that you're putting all this time and effort in. So this is a very important part of the function of, of what you plan. And of course, the council decides what they get paid as well. It's usually done with uh, a separate body that gives you a recommendation for any changes, and then you get the final vote on it. But of course, you're you're comparing that to other communities in, in your province as well, and you also are scrutinized by the public as far as the decisions that are made on that. So I've been in places where they pay far too little. Uh, where I moved from, I, I thought, gee, they're just not, they're not being uh, fair to themselves. And so you can be overly uh, cautious on that, but you really want to have it so that you're not uh, making it so tough on somebody looking at what their commitment would, would be and they just can't see that they can take the time to do that. So it, it's one of those mixed bags that you have to take a look at all the pluses and minuses on that. Just to run through this though, as you can see on the, the wall here, the councillors received $28,487 uh, annually and one third of anything that you earn as you're serving on council is tax deductible, or I'm sorry, not tax, uh, not tax at all, exempt. That right now, it sounds like that's gonna be changed by 2019 by the federal government. Uh, so that's that's something that we'll be watching closely. And of course, council of the day will probably decide uh, what alterations will be made on that. Uh, you also get paid for extra time. I just missed the mayor that receives 58,924,000 uh, annually, but you get paid per diems for extra time that you're away, say for conventions or uh, different um, trade shows, for example, that you're representing the city for, you're definitely getting compensated for that as well. Uh, if we have meetings that are one to two hours, it's $50, uh, I'm sorry, can't read that one, $50 per hour. And yeah, we also have $100 per hour for, I think that's, that's wrong, $100 total. For a three or four hour yeah. meeting, $50 for a one to two It says per hour here, it yeah. shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what, why they had that mark. So it's fifty dollars total. It's just a misprint on here. Just, just ignoring the slash. Per hour. The slash isn't supposed to be there. <laughs> if you wanted to keep those meetings longer. <laughs> now and before I give it off to uh, Lucien, I'll just touch on uh, pecuniary interest. 
you can call that conflict of interest too. A lot of times this is totally misconstrued by public members. This is not to actually make a trap for any council members or the public wanting to serve on council. It's actually to clear the way for people to be able to serve on council. So if you're a business person that's uh, selling fuel, for example, gasoline, and the contract is going out for the city for uh, supplying gasoline, well, there's no problem for you being on council. You just have to remove yourself from that discussion completely, remove yourself from the council chambers, and it's, it's listed in the minutes that you've left the room. When the decision is made on that subject, then you're called and you come back into the room. So that's really what this is, is to make sure that you're not voting on something for yourself or your direct family members, parents, children. Uh, interestingly enough to share with you, it's not your brothers or sisters, siblings. That's not covered on that. But uh, I will tell you that when I was involved with that, uh, my brother was a developer. Uh, so anytime he came to the council meeting, I removed myself for a uh, potentially perceived conflict of interest. So, you get to control what you feel you're comfortable with and also what the public would be perceiving that you're doing so you get you can control that so this is really just to protect yourself uh, that you can come and serve on council uh, we had somebody come and ask us uh, just beforehand uh, well, i think months ago can i come on here because i've got this type of involvement that would uh, be financially uh, dependent on the city and that's, there's no problem at all anything with that business that you've been involved with you just have to remove yourself so it, you know it's definitely something of concern for uh, for individuals looking at serving on council just to go back to the remuneration section we have there it's my understanding that uh, you also have the option of uh, getting on the city development that, that well, actually you've got that or do you have that uh, information I, I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. How much do you yeah. want to? Uh, the, sorry? I think I said I think no. the answer is yes. But yeah. I'm no, uh, uh, council members are eligible for city benefits. Um, the only thing they would be eligible for is LAPD. Um, but I believe the city does uh, make uh, contributions to our city uh, account. So if that answers your question. So is it, yeah. is it sunlight? Yeah. It, it is sunlight. Sunlight. Yeah. That's the whole package. Yes. Yeah. And and we do have uh, we do have our benefit policy that if we request that we can provide that to you also here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on what we've covered so far? And if not, I'll hand it over to Lucien to carry on. Okay. So if I will be a little bit the. Um, um, not so much the tasty morsel bits about the virtues of running and, and uh, what you like, you know, how, how the machinery works. It's more the technical rendition of, of, of some of the things pertaining to the election itself and some other items. But this is a little bit more election specific, if you will. So the first question is about eligibility and, and what do you need to be to be eligible to run. So you must be 18 years of, of age on election day, you must be a Canadian citizen. You must have lived in the city of Otaska for at least six months preceding uh, nomination day. Slightly different parameters for voting than they are for running. For running, you actually have to be a resident of the municipality for six months prior to. To vote, you have to be a, a, a resident of Alberta for six months prior and a resident on the day of the uh, election. So a little bit of a difference between those two things. Uh, move on to the next. So how to become a candidate. Before you start fundraising, fill out Form 3A, which is the uh, Notice of Intent registration. So Notice of Intent to become a candidate. It's the Form 3A. Now, the 3A uh, can be handed in at the same time as a nomination paper. It can be handed in ahead of time, and it can even be handed in afterwards. But the key to all of this is that you can't receive um, you can't receive any type of uh, remuneration or any type of, a, of financial assistance, whether that's cash or in kind, uh, prior to filing your your Form 3A. So if you have any inkling at all that you will be receiving any assistance at all, and assistance could be Am I getting ahead of myself here? Is this, uh, we, we do talk about it a little bit more later on too, but things like 
a campaign space, uh, receiving items at cost rather than full full market value, uh, food for a reception, somebody making a website for you. These are all things with the monetary value attached to them, and you would have to file your Form 38 before you do it. Conversely, if you do go 100% only on your own uh, financial resources with no assistance from anybody, and as long as it's not more than $10,000, then you don't have to file that form. My advice to anybody would always be, when in doubt, file the form, the sooner the better. That's my advice for, for anybody in this. So uh, I'll get to that, a little bit more of that in a minute. But basically, uh, your nomination papers have to be filed during that two hour window on the 18th. I sometimes get asked the question, when's the deadline? Well, that's a tricky question because you must submit during those two hours. It's not like you can do it now, you can't. So it has to be brought in during those two hours. You have to bring it in yourself. You either have to bring it in yourself. Am I, am I cutting my own thing here? Uh, later on as well? No. Okay, I'm good? Okay. So um, you can either bring it in yourself, but if you don't bring it in yourself, you're going to have to have it signed in front of a commissioner for oaths and have it commissioned prior to it being brought in by whomever it is that's going to bring it in. Anybody can bring it in, but the key is, is that you either have to get it commissioned at the counter with you standing there and me standing there, or you have to get somebody ahead of time to commission it. So you can find there's many people that are commissioner for oaths, realtors, sometimes post office people, uh, lawyers, and uh, development officers are, are all, we, we have a number of people that are commissioner for oaths. I'm actually commissioner for oaths as well. So that's my only thing. If you could, What I don't want to see happen and what I have seen happen is somebody sends their form, with, let's say in this case, with their spouse who kind of sent for me, they've already signed it, they didn't sign it in front of the commissioner, they figure that's going to get signed over there, and then it comes to me and I look at it and I say, I can't sign it, I didn't witness you signing this. You didn't witness your spouse signing this. I can't sign this off. And then they're, uh, and they're so that's uh, that's an important uh, consideration in that process. And there's also a deposit. We will extract the grand sum of fifty bucks from you, five zero dollars, fifty dollars. Uh, that deposit is refundable if you either win or you get as many votes as the person as if you get half as many votes as the person who finished in the last spot and got in. So for instance. In this case, if it's for council, it's whoever finished sixth, half that number of votes. Okay? And for mayor, half that number of votes. So uh, that's what you have to do to get it. Otherwise, uh, we, we get to uh, take it, put it in, you know, in loonies and run through the hall with it. So it goes into our general revenue at that point. So we, if, if, it, if any uh, deposits that are not returned because they didn't affect the area are lost to the municipality's general, the general uh, revenue. Uh, on your nomination form, the form three, there's a spot there to put five names, uh, five electors. Now, uh, it, you'll have to have the full full address, uh, including their like their full civic address and name and signature of the people of the eligible electors. And it's very important that they're all eligible electors of this municipality to sign your nomination papers. You can get more, and I suggest you do. Uh, if something goes wrong with one of your electors, if for some reason one is ineligible, this could inadvertently cause you to become ineligible to stay on Canada. It, it, it could, it, it could uh, disqualify you. So, uh, not a bad idea to get as many signatures as you can. Might even be able to use it as a bit of a, uh, as a bit of a um, campaign, uh, uh, you know, a process where you're getting people interested. It's up to you, but at the end of the day, uh, having more names, is, there's no downside to it, and the upside is, is it better protects you as a candidate. Yes? Is there a form, formal sheet that they go on, or can they just go on the back of the nomination? Yes, they can go on the back of it, that's fine. Okay, you, conversely, you could make multiple copies of the form and hand in multiple copies. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, people will have to what they're signing, it has to be clear what they're signing for and that they've got all the relevant information. So, um, kind of wish they would do these forms a little bit differently to allow for more signatures on it for that reason. But that's not how, this is what they refer to as the prescribed form, and we're required to use the prescribed form. So, that's what we're using. Can I have family? Your signature, so it's like you 
If they are eligible electors, there is nothing in the act that says they can't be. So that is. How do you find out before you sign the papers if they're eligible? Right? Yeah, I'm getting the question out of them. <laughs> um, you, I mean, you know, you're you're going you're going to have to. Uh, I mean, certainly, hopefully, these would be people that you would have some idea and some assurance, and they could make sure that that you know. I mean, by all means, read to them the criteria, or have them contact me if they're not sure. Uh, you That's know, my question: You could contact me for them. Absolutely. Is this person eligible? No, you no. could have them call me and ask me that, and I would be happy to do that. And explain to them whether or not they're eligible. I will, what I will do is I won't even tell them whether they're eligible. I will go over with them what the criteria is, and then they will determine whether or not they need it. So the onus is always on the elector to determine their eligibility to nominate, to run, to vote. So at the end of the day, I can go over the rules with them. I can explain them what they are, but I can't say, "Oh yeah, you're definitely a resident." That is uh, at the end of the day. That individual has to come to that conclusion or not. So we get into these big things where there's been challenges and stuff based upon residency. And uh, in sections uh, 47 and 48, they talk about voter eligibility in the Local Authorities Election Act. And they get into great language where they talk about the voter's intent. And uh, it's, it's a really wonderful thing because at the end of the day, and this was uh, uh, subject to some case law that uh, for the county of St. Paul, with some people who had summer homes that said, geez, I live about the same number of, of, of uh, days in both places, where am I a resident of? They ran and there was some challenge on that basis. And uh, basically, uh, as a result, they actually did make a change to section uh, 48, I believe it is. So basically, I'm just going to read this to you really quickly. I don't want to get too much of the time on this. So uh, basically, so um, as I mentioned before, to be eligible to vote, uh, so to be eligible elector, you'd be eligible to vote. So. You have to be 18 years old, you have to be a Canadian citizen, you have to have resided in Alberta for six months, and you have to be a resident on the uh, in the area, an area in this case is defined as the corporate limits of the city of Nassau, on election day. What it says is a person can only, for purposes of this act, this is section 48, if you want to read this, uh, a person may be a resident of only one place at a time for the purposes of voting under this act. Okay. Now, the caveat there is summer villages, they're a whole different kettle of fish. So, but for purposes of, of this election, you can only have one whole place of resident, residency. If you have more than one residence, person shall, in, consistent with subsection 1.1, designate one place as a person's place of residency. And then here's the lovely clause. This is, this is, the, this is the, 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 the money clause right here. The resident of a person is the place where the person lives and sleeps, and to which, when the person is absent, the person intends to return. And the key word here is intends, because at the end of the day, some of this depends on intention. Now, some people said, well, I'm still not sure how to determine that, and this is what came up in this case law case. So what happened is they added section 1.1, which says, for the purposes of subsection 1, etc., a person shall designate, here's how we're going to tell you how to figure it out, in accordance with the following in the order of priority. The address shown on your driver's license. The address on your income tax. The address at which the rest of your mail is delivered. In that order. So if you don't have, for instance, the driver's license, go to the next thing. Where did your income tax go? If for some reason you don't have that, or you don't have the, you know, then where does the rest of your mail come? And so then they said, if you're not sure where you live, in terms of what's considered to be a residence, this is your guideline. This is this is how you're going to determine that. So because these things are so highly individualized, it's incumbent upon the elector to figure out what their residence is. Not myself, yourself, or anybody else. What are the challenges for nominating? So for our five signatures, I know you had said once there was someone who was elected because nobody questioned. So who is it that questions our signatures? Oh, uh, what what happens is somebody can plunk down their, I think it's three or four hundred bucks to the court of Queen's bench and bring it before a judge and say that they're going to challenge it because they've they've uh, asked to see your nomination papers, they've looked at your nomination papers. And upon viewing so, they have come up with this belief that there's a problem. So then they go to the courts, they file with the courts, and the courts say, okay, uh, first of all, if you get past the first stage, 
we'll let you go to the second stage because we think there might be enough evidence. And then they will actually proceed with a court case and the judge will determine it. And sometimes it means dragging that person in and saying, do you live here? You know, uh, What they're not allowed to do is they're never allowed to ask the person how they voted. They can confirm that the person did or did not sign up as a nominator for that particular person. The challenger must live in the area where there's a city. Yeah, there's a, there's a list of who exactly can challenge it. It has to be another elector or there's a, a council can do it. There's a couple other bodies that can do it. But it, it can't just be anybody. It has to be somebody with a vested interest in it. So Luciana's returning off three, you want to determine the uh, submission to the ballot? Um, I have a limited number of things that I look for, when, that I'm allowed to look for, and that I'm required to look for when I accept a nomination. I have to see that the candidate has signed it, that it's been properly commissioned, or that it is, or that I do properly commission. That there are five names on the list. I don't verify anything about the validity of those names, just that there's five of them. On their face, they have to, it has to be plausible. If you know. Nobody challenges. Uh, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't check to make sure they're valid. Correct. It's not one of my responsibilities to check the validity of nominators on that list. That's not my so responsibility. Under what circumstances would you advise a potential candidate that the form that he submitted would disqualify you? Or, uh, I, I wouldn't. I would merely accept. I would merely accept it or not accept it according to what I'm allowed to accept or not. If you don't pay your deposit. Sorry? When did you notify that it's accepted or not? At the counter. At so you the come counter. in, so you come in or the person comes in to file the papers. Yeah. I'm either gonna look at it and say, there's five names, they've signed it, or they're signing it in front of me, or they've signed it in front of a commissioner, they've given me their fifty bucks. Did this mean anything? They got the main That's the only things I'm allowed to challenge. But I don't challenge them, I just say they are or they aren't. So if there's four names on there, I go, I can't accept this paper. If there's four names on it, better go find another name. Very good question. It has to be in a, it has to either be cash, cash, cash. Debit is okay. I will take debit. It cannot be a personal check. It cannot be a credit card. No personal check, no credit card. It can be a money order. It can be a bank draft. I don't know why you get a bank draft for that. Uh, I'm going to guess that we'll probably 93.7% of the candidates will debit it, uh, but if they come in with with cold hard cash, that works too. It has to be it's an immediately liquid form. So, very good question. Thanks for asking. It. So, uh, I'm going to talk about your homework. All of your candidates' acceptance. There is a list. Uh, when you sign it, you're saying not only that you're going to keep confidentiality, you're going to abide by the rules, you're going to do all the things you're supposed to do, but it also, but it also is important when you sign it uh, that you understand that one of the things you're signing is that you have read all the following sections, and these are those sections, okay? Uh, basically, it's incumbent upon the candidate to ensure that they have read and understand those sections. By all means, read those the sooner the better and ask your questions the sooner the better. If you wish to ask me, I'm happy to tell you what I know. Ask municipal affairs, ask your legal counsel. Whoever it is that you feel comfortable with, if you don't understand what the sections are, but do read them and do ask questions if you're not understanding the nature of what's in there or what exactly it's saying. That's a, this is a very important thing because you're committing to it when you sign it. You're saying that you have read those sections. So these sections are in our package, am I correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And if for some reason something seems to be missing, please let us know, and we will we will make that uh, available. But uh, it, it, there shouldn't be a problem. They should all be there. So uh, can I move on to agents and scrutineers? You may, but you don't have to identify an agent when you file your papers. I don't like the way that the form lays itself out because it almost looks like you should have one, you better have one. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I, I guess I would suggest that it's uh, all over the map in terms of whether people have agents or not. 
And what's interesting about agents is that the act doesn't say what the agent is supposed to do. It says the candidate can have an agent and that the agent does whatever the candidate tells them to do. That's basically what it says in the act. Um, I really wish it was a bit more prescriptive, but common things that agents do, and every, every candidate has a different preference for this, they might have all, they might be a signatory to your to your bank account if you're doing uh, a, 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 an election account for that. I think you have to yourself be named on it, but I think you can have your agent named on it as well. Do you recall? Not on top of your head. Not on top of I think so. But a more common thing would be if they act as a scrutineer, uh, they serve as, uh, they quite often will be involved in the procurement of goods and services and things that uh, you are needing for your campaign, but really there's nothing that says an agent is this that does this. It says the agent is whatever it is that the candidate says, their duties are whatever the candidate says they are. Quite often I see them as scrutinists. Can an agent act for more than one candidate? Can an agent act for more than one candidate? Good question. Let me look it up. I think the answer is no, but let me look it up. It, it's it's um, intuitively. I'm, I'm I'm speaking intuitively. I, I'm not I'm not knowing for sure. So let me just look up. <laughs> I missed a good one. Well, let's start with the definition. I don't think that just Let me read what it says in 68.1. It may not articulate it directly. That's what I'm going to find out. Each person nominated as a candidate may on the nomination form appoint an elector to be the candidate's official agent. They may. Uh, if, you, if it becomes necessary to appoint somebody new, the candidate shall notify the returning officer in writing uh, of the uh, contact information of the new official agent. A person who has within 10 years been convicted of, a, of an offense under this act, the Election Act, or the Canada Elections Act, can be appointed as your official agent. No candidate shall act as official agent for any other candidate. Okay, so candidates can't be each other's agents. Uh, but it doesn't say that they can't be an agent for somebody else as well. So it doesn't say that. So <laughs> theoretically, you could. Uh, <laughs> the duties of an official agent are those assigned to the official agent by the I love this, this thought. The duties of an official agent are those assigned to the official agent by the candidate. That's it. That's as much detail as it goes into. Okay. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the next part, which is related but different, and that has to do with scrutineers. I think we're on the right. Yeah. We're on the right. Okay. Sorry. You have to, you well, first of all, file your Form 3A before anybody gives you anything. Second of all, um, you have to come up with a value for it. There's, there's two parts. There's a front end part and a back end part. The front end part of the Form 3A is here's my banking information, etc. And then there's a back end part which has to be filed by March 1st of every year where you have to say who gave you, uh, basically you have to summarize all the, the things that you were, you were given and you have to at that point, uh, I, uh, I don't know that you need to do it sooner, but you have to do it by the time you file your disclosure. You have to come up with a value for it. You're going to have to come up with something. It has to be reasonable. It has to be at market value. Receipts are good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so your receipts should certainly help. But uh, that is probably a good piece of advice. If somebody does something for you, provides you a service or goods, 
uh, explain that you're going to have to establish a value for it. So you need to find out what that fair market value is. Yeah. For monetary gifts and donations, you have to establish a, a separate bank account. Yeah. So, so you may establish a bank account that you never use because everything that somebody gives you is in a in kind or non monetary uh, value. Is it, that's lovely. However, that's as the as the rules stand. That's how it's written. So you could very well end up with, yeah, you're gifted, but at the same time you have to, you know. Now, what's the intent of the act? I believe the intent of the act is if somebody gives you money, you're putting it in that account, now you can account for it, right? Uh, this is kind of the law of unintended consequences, I think, where they say, hey, you got a separate bank account, are you going to use it? No, because everything that people have provided for me has been in kind or has been uh, you know, a donation or a free, but not in monetary sense. So now you have this white elephant of a bank account, right? So in the long run, what's it going to what's it end up doing with it? You're going to end up closing it because nothing ever went in there. So if you're given a contribution just for conversation, you're given a check, maybe through submit your 3A. Yeah. And you don't cash it until you submit your 3A. Oh, yeah. Bring in your 3A as soon as that happens, or give the check back to them even better. So that nobody can have you remove all that and say, hey, can you kind of hang on to this for a little bit? And then you file your 3A and come back and say, yeah, I'll take that check now. Right? Get your bank account established, all that other stuff. Uh, the safest practice is to get your 3A in before you even get given a check. But for goodness sake, don't deposit the check before you have your 3A. You're supposed to have a separate bank account anyway. But for sure have your 3A in. Yes. I see no reason why not if you have the information that we need to do that. My other question for it is bank accounts will we'll have to be separate. If I'm using my own personal money to buy signs, to buy pins, do I have to put it into this other bank account and purchase it from the other bank account? Or what is it? Can I use my own personal bank account? <laughs> So, yeah. so, so if you sell fun up to ten thousand dollars, you aren't required under the act right. to open up a separate account. Okay. But it is anything above that ten thousand, or even if for everything else you're using your own money, but then you get um, a donation of pins, then the pins count as an in-kind donation and would require you to fill out the form three A. So, still fill out the form three A, but as long as my donations or gifts or whatever you want to yeah. report them are under ten thousand dollars, I don't need a thing. If there's no money coming in, yeah, I need a bank. yeah, okay. yeah. Because uh, it's just my own money that I'm using so far that I would, let's say, gift it certain pins from someone. So, like, hey, here you go. Mm -hmm. Then I yeah. don't need the bank manager. So, yeah. So let's now just to be sure. But, yeah, sorry, let's, just let's to clarify. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, which section is that? Is under 18ish, 20ish? Uh, filing your 147.21. You look at you go. 147.21. Let's read what exactly it says there, okay? All right. So, uh, just to give you the exact rendition of what's in here. So, this is what it says No candidate may accept campaign contributions, including the funds of the candidate, unless the candidate is registered under this act with the municipality in which the candidate intends to run. Don't get excited too yet because there's a notwithstanding clause. Okay? But let's leave, leave it like that for now. Number two, the municipality shall maintain a register of candidates in relation to each election and shall register in it any candidate who is eligible to be nominated at the time of registration and who files with the municipality an application for registration, setting out full name and address of the candidate, the address of the place or places where the records of the candidate are maintained and of the place to which communications may be addressed. The names and addresses of the financial institution to be used on our behalf of the candidate as depositories for campaign contributions made to that candidate and the names of the signing authorities for each depository referred to in clause one. Quite often to be the candidate and possibly their name. Okay, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. When there is any change in the information required to be provided under subsection two, the registered candidate shall notify the municipality in writing within 48 hours. After the change and on re receipt of the notice, the municipality shall update the registers uh, of the candidate accordingly. So we have this thing that says, here's our three A's, here's our register, 
all these people have registered their three A's with us. Here's what they say. Oh, look, there's a change that comes in. We'll make a note of it. We change that registry. See, see it changes, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And this is new. This was never, we had not, this part came to effect in 2014, but it came in effect after the last general election. So this is the first general election that this is required. At. But there's more. So it says, uh, you can send us the notice under by fax or electronic mail for, for, the, for when you have a change. You can send it by fax or email. Uh, a candidate who contravenes a subsection one to three is guilty of an offense of a fine not more than a thousand bucks. This section does not apply to a candidate if, no, this is, the, this is the key here. This section, so this whole thing I just read to you, this section does not apply to a candidate if the candidate's entire campaign is funded exclusively out of the candidate's own funds up to a maximum of $10,000. So, and the only other clause is that it came into effect January 1st, 2014. So that's what's written on, on this particular thing. Hold on, I just want to check. She wants to check something. Okay. okay. While she's doing that, uh, we were talking about, uh, we talked about self-funded, we talked about limitations on, oh, limitations on contributions. Uh, if a company or a business wishes to support you in some monetary or non-monetary matter, some some uh, value, uh, whether it's in kind or whether it's cash, there is a maximum of $5,000 per year. That's what it says, $5,000 per year. Just so you know, that's the most that any one company can do that for. Uh, section 114, registration of candidates, we talked about that. Offenses, uh, well, there's the fine up to $1,000, and then there's another section about offenses. Do you want me to talk about screw gears in the meantime? Sorry? Did, did you find what you were looking for? Uh, just two more minutes. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime, I will talk about agents and screw gears at the voting station. So, uh, you may have, you may act, first of all, you may act as your own scrutineer. You may appoint scrutineers. Your, your agent may act as your scrutineer. Uh, what do scrutineers do? Scrutineers observe the voting process and or the, count, the vote counting process. They provide a level of accountability to the process. They're an, an important part, but they're not a mandatory part. Uh, you don't have to appoint scrutineers. You can serve as your own scrutineer. There are some limitations. The first thing is, is that you're allowed at any one time at the voting station uh, one scrutineer. So uh, we will have the main station, and I'm going to talk about this for a second, different than other elections we've had in here, we did not divide people up into voting subdivisions, which is not the same thing as wards, but there are voting subdivisions. We didn't do voting subdivisions. We are having one Grand Central main station at the drill hall this year. That's where our advanced votes are going to be, and that's where our election day uh, is going to be as well. The only other voting that's going on is our institutional vote, which will which will bring uh, two teams of three workers to seven different locations. I'll say it is, and they will be busting up into teams. You can have a scrutineer follow one of those teams if you wish. You can have somebody at the main station as well. Uh, you can't uh, overlap other than to pass the baton from one person to another. Uh, if you come in to vote and you're Joe Voter at that moment and not scrutineer because you already have a scrutineer there, that's fine as long as you're going in voting and leaving, right? If you're relieving the scrutineer, that's fine too. Uh, you know, sit down, send them off, whatever it is. Some people rotate scrutineers throughout the day. Uh, when it comes to the counting process, things are a little bit different here because we use the electronic tabulating system. So there's a manual ballot that people will draw circles in. Uh, fill in circles. That's when you get fed into a, so they, they're going to put it into a privacy screen. They're going to bring it to a machine. It's going to be fed into a scanner. The scanner is going to suck it in. It's going to determine whether or not there's a problem with that with, with the vote. So that's kind of the thing. Uh, fewer, fewer people are casting ineligible ballots. So they're going to find out if there's a problem with your voting. Like, for instance, an overvote, where let's say they voted for seven council members instead of six. This thing will spit it back out and say, hey, that's an overvote. Right? They say, yeah, I'm going to send it in anyhow. They'll say, okay. It'll go in, and it'll count it as an overvote. It'll reject everything out there. Or they go, okay, 
uh, I don't want this, I want this fixed. So then they go back, uh, their, their ballot gets marked spoiled, it gets preserved separately as a spoiled ballot, which is not confusing the rejected ballot, and then they get issued a new ballot. And they can do it again, do it all over again. And this time hopefully you get right. But the nice thing about the electronic tabulators is the amount of time that it saves everybody at the end. And the part that I really like about it, and if you don't mind me using the term sexy, the part that's really sexy about it is that you still have the physical ballot if there is a problem. And so I like to think of it as the best of both worlds. I've never used this before, so I am a little bit excited about having, being able to use this system. So uh, I am happy about this. Uh, I'm hoping that it'll save a lot of time. And basically, we should have uh, results within, I'm hoping, within half an hour to an hour for sure. Uh, that everybody can, uh, can understand what, what, what's come out of those what, what's come out of those machines. So, uh, one important, very very important thing. Uh, you know how I was saying about before about prescribed forms and how they give us these prescribed forms and we're stuck with them and that's what we have to use. Somebody didn't think it was particularly important to make a prescribed form for something very important. If you want a scrutineer to be present at the station on your behalf. You're required to provide them with a written undertaking saying that they're acting as your scrutineer. There's no prescribed form for it. Why is there no prescribed form for it? I don't know. I keep asking them to make one. But there is no prescribed form for it. But what is it going to have to say? It's going to have to say, I so and so candidate hereby appoint so and so as my scrutineer at such and such a station on election day, sign the candidate. Then that scrutineer will hand that letter. To somebody, and in this case, it'll probably be if it's at the main voting station, the presiding uh, deputy returning officer will be Jacqueline, or myself as returning officer, will hand it to one of us. We will look at it and say, Lovely, now you're going to fill out a Form 10. The Form 10 is something that your agent will also fill out uh, if you have one, and it's anything that your scrutineers will fill out that basically says that they will uphold the secrecy of the vote. So in the process of being a scrutineer, you may inadvertently see something you're not supposed to because voters are not perfect and they do silly things sometimes. Okay? And if that happens, they are sworn to sworn secrecy. That's what the Form 10 is for. What the Form 10 is not for is it's not for, it's not the form that they need to come in with. They need to come in with the letter and then they fill out a Form 10. And many, 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 many times I've had somebody come in with just the Form 10 and I say, that's nice, where's your letter from the candidate? And they say, I don't have one. And I say, I can't recognize you as a scrutineer. You're required to have a letter from your candidate. Then they have to go conjure one up. And so get you have Form 10 on hand the day of? We will have Form 10s. We will have Form 10s. Form 10s are very easy to get. Anybody can get them. The problem is that there's no Form 10A and Form 10B. And if there was a Form 10A, that is, you know, and it was just a fill in the blanks kind of thing. And, you know, for the candidate, I'd love that. Please, please. But so far, Santa hasn't brought me that. So well, we're stuck. for the uh, election date. Is this happening the it, 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 it doesn't have to happen before the election. If you want to, uh, because what it contemplates in the act is the scrutineer presenting the letter at the station. And that's what that's what's contemplated in the act. So line this up ahead of time as much as possible. Go ahead and have your, uh, you know, that letter. They can even bring in a form ten if they want. I want them to sign it in front of me. That would be nice. Uh, although it doesn't explicitly say that there's no countersign on a form ten. Don't know why. You can do it anytime between nomination day and actual voting. You 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 could give me a letter saying that so and so will be your uh, scrutineers. But what it contemplates in the act is that the scrutineer actually hands it in at the, at the polling station. Okay, that's what it actually stated in the act. Okay, what my what I think the intent of the act is, if I were to look at it that way, the intent of the act is somebody is going to have to prove that they've been sent on your campaign to act as that scrutineer, and this is a piece of paper trail to prove that. Okay, that's what I think the intent of the act is: is to is to verify that that person. Because anybody can download a form 10 and sign it and say, I'm here at so-so's uh, scrutineer. But there's nothing in there from the candidate saying that. That's why we need the letter. And I really, 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 really wish they had both 
the other part was a prescribed form. So they, they don't they don't have that. Did you ever find what you were looking for? Okay. All right. So uh, just to go back to the question, also just to uh, make a, a slight correction. So uh, under section 147.31 of the Local Authority Selection Act. Uh, regarding opening bank accounts. So um, I'll read this out. So a candidate shall ensure that a campaign account in the name of the candidate's election campaign or the candidate is open at a financial institution for the purposes of the election campaign as soon as possible after. And there's two, uh, two uh, subsections here. So scenario one, um, the account must be opened um, if the total amount of campaign contributions from any person, corporation, trade union, or employee organization first exceeds $5,000 in the aggregate, so including anything in kind, or uh, the other option, the total amount of campaign contributions from any person, corporation, trade union, or employee organization in combination with any money paid by the candidate um, out of the candidate's own funds exceeds $5,000. So in one scenario, it's totally funded by an outside, uh, by outside parties, and the other one is combination of the candidate's own funds and and outside organizations. So um, uh, in relation to your question, if you intend to self-fund um, more or less here up to $5,000, and then whatever you get over that, if whatever you get over that would push you over the five thousand dollars, then you would need to open a finance. So this is why I was wondering about five. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So if you're over the five, then you need to open an account for the yeah. rest of it. There. Okay. Yeah. It's a good question. Clear as mud. Does everybody get that? Yeah. Right. There's no money exchange. How you yeah. Yeah. Well, you're not going to put that through a bank account. Yeah. But when you do the back end of it, you're going to have to come up with a value. Yeah. 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 Sure yeah. yeah. Although uh, going on in that section under duties of the candidate, so a candidate shall ensure that contributions, real property, personal property, or services um, are valued. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah, if if um, the fair market value of those pins is $30, um, if the person making them would otherwise charge $30 for them, or if the person bought them for 30 and then gifted them, that would be the that would be the market value to that item. Yep. But you wouldn't have to open a bank account yet because it's not worth 5000 Exactly. So yep. thank you for correcting me on yep. that. Appreciate that. So, so that's good. Uh, we talked about campaign expenses. We talked about campaign finances. Um, just, just, um, sorry? Yeah, put on the one with the deadline. Yeah, let me, let me talk about that for just a second. Um, so you must register to become a candidate, like we said that before accepting outside contributions. Uh, now you're going to have to file a disclosure form. This isn't new. Uh, this has been around for an election or two. But there's a, a back end, I call it the back end because you do it after the fact. Uh, that you that you must disclose by March 1st, even if you're not successful, uh, you have to uh, provide a. Uh, and what's that form called? Do we know what that form's called? There's a form for that as well. The financial disclosure. The financial disclosure form. I don't know which form number that is, but there's a finance. There is a form. Form 21. Form 21. Okay. All right. And uh, so that that you have to follow that form by March 1st next year. And include all those lovely things, the $30 pins and everything else. So even if you're not successful, you have to put it in. If you don't, it could be grounds for disqualifying you for the next election. So, okay. so if you submit that, does somebody pursue it? Anybody that wants to. It becomes a public record, and the people that can take you to task are the same people that can take you to task for the other things. An, an, an elector of the municipality can take you to task on if they felt that there was something not report, reported properly. Because if you're successful and you don't report that, you don't hand it in or you don't do it right, somebody else decides that it's an eligible election, decides if you're going to take you to task, they could get you disqualified. So essentially just put it in place so that you're not just taking $10,000 from someone and like, oh, I spent yeah. a campaign, but I actually spent Yes. Yeah. And then there's a whole bailiwick about what you have to do with unexpected, uh, unexpended election funds. If you have leftover expenditure, leftover funds from another party, 
you know, third party contribution, they gave you $5,000 and you did you spent 4800 of it, you still got $200. You have to either give it to a charity or the municipality. There's no process for that. I'm not going to get into the full rendition of that. But just bear that in mind that there is a process that if you have surplus campaign funds from outside sources, that you have to do stuff with it. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> Spend them if you got them, right? Election signage. So what happens uh, with election signage is uh, every municipality has the ability to pass a bylaw that sets out rules for signage. We have some uh, relatively strict rules here and in a recently passed bylaw that allow that does not allow signs on public property. It allows it on private property only and in such a manner that it doesn't impede traffic as well. So not only does it have to be on private property, and just for sake of argument, this may be your house, that might be your sidewalk, and that might be the boulevard that you're expected to take care of. The side of property, the sidewalk, the boulevard, not your property. You can't put signs on somebody's boulevard. Is there a setback requirement from the Sorry? Is there a setback requirement? From the sidewalk? There is no setback requirement except to say that it has to be on that person's property. It has to be on their property. So generally speaking, if we get a complaint about this or if we see it for ourselves, we'll ask the candidate to move it. If they don't move it, then I'll move it or I'll get somebody to move it. Um, you know, sort of a thing. If somebody continues to do it, there's a process for issuing fines and things like this. But basically, the, the important part I want to tell you is that unlike many other elections where you'll see, like for instance in Edmonton, where every boulevard and every uh, uh, median is peppered with signs already, uh, here, you're not allowed to do that. In fact, you're not even allowed to put signs up until nomination day, until after the close of nominations at noon. So it doesn't talk about it that we have to hold it open and stuff like this. But that's the, that's the, the yardstick that's put into our particular bylaw is that it has to be. Admitted. And there's size restrictions that it has to be not more than one square meter in side area, must not exceed 1.2 meters in height, must be freestanding uh, in the sense that it, you know, I mean, it's like, you, you know, you can have a stake thing, but it's not going to be hanging off of something else. Exactly. Um, you say you can't screw it on a fence. That's freestanding. That's freestanding. Yeah. It's not hung from a tree, though, for example. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, you, you are subject to height restrictions, though. So you have to make sure that you're keeping the height restrictions because there is a, a 1.2 meter height restriction from ground to top of sign. So if you do hang it on a fence, you better make sure it doesn't fall over. For private property, like if it's a business, do you have permission from the business? Yeah. Just as long as you have permission. Okay. Basically, you still have to have it at three feet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and as well as, of course, Election Day on the 16th. Uh, there is a prohibition from having a vehicle with election signs. This is what it says is no vehicle with election signs may drive within 50 meters of any polling station. This is really easy when it comes to the drill hall and not as easy when it comes to the institutional vote because we've got institutional vote in seven places. So there is a map. Did we give them a copy of the map? Can they get it? No. All, uh, all copies of the institutional vote uh, locations with the 50 meter radius are available on the election page on our website. So that you know where and where, if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna do a drive by signing, then then you'll you'll know where you can do that. Well, I have a quick question about the drive by signing. Because if we're not allowed to have signs on public property, we have a sign stuck to the side of our vehicle and it's parked on the street. Yeah. Um, I think we had a little bit of this debate at the council meeting. Do you remember? Do you remember how that got adjudicated? Yeah. 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 As part of what you're allowed uh, permission as well. So the safety factor comes in more than what the sign by law yeah. the actually comes in. But no, there's nothing as far as height restriction that it has to be on the vehicle. Uh, but a park as opposed to, to driving, because this thing says uh, may drive within 50 meters. But what about stationary vehicles? Have we talked about that? As long as they're not within 50 meters. But I think part of the argument was, or part of the question, part of the question was, is the fact that that vehicle is on the roadway and it's got a sign on it, right? Yeah. And I think they did discuss that in the council meeting and they opted to leave that out of the bylaw. So it would, yeah, it would be uh, allowed as it's not addressed in the bylaw. <laughs> Well, you know, and that's a good point, and that's exactly something that hopefully they'll see from reading this, but also it's something that we can perhaps try to put a little bit of clarification on mm -hmm. on our city on our city election website. So maybe the specific issue, if we can just note that, uh, make a specific uh, note of the parked vehicle with signs in it that are in, that's in the public roadway. Because like one of us puts one on our vehicle, well, going to call it. Somebody's going to say, hey, that's not on private property, that's on public property, and it's a sign. Yeah. But the sign is on your private vehicle, the private vehicle is private property. Well, the vehicle is private property. It's so private property. Okay, so it's a good question. Uh, it's a very, it, it is, and so it's a very good question. So thank you for that question. We will look further into that one. Um, on uh, election day, oh, on your advertising, you can't. Uh, I'll say I'll say it this way, then I'll explain it. You can't have a duck. You can't have a what looks like a ballot. If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. You can't have anything that looks like a ballot on your on your uh, on your in your campaign materials. Okay, uh, the likeness of the ballot is only allowed to be used by the returning officer. Uh, we can advertise it, but you can't, sort of a thing. So uh, it basically it says that uh, election advertising cannot contain images of a ballot with a mark for a candidate. Includes online advertisements, and that's section 148 sub 5. If you want to see exactly what it says there, so um, advertisements may not be placed on or inside any of the voting stations or any of the election days, including the institutional vote locations. And where this could trip people up sometimes, maybe, is if you have pins or buttons and you have people wearing them. As soon as they get into the station, they get asked to move them. If they have a t-shirt, they may get told to cover it up and we'll change it. Or in one case, when I heard of a case of a guy turning it inside out, but in any case, somehow that has to be covered up. So you, they can't be a walking billboard inside of it. And of course, at the station itself, you can't put advertising. Okay. Now, there is kind of an exception to the 50-meter uh, rule, and that's if 
I own a house and it's closer than 50 meters to a voting station and you want to put the sign on my lawn and that would be now that is allowed okay that's one of the things they specified is that you can do that uh, the specific prohibition that council I think was getting at was driving up and down with signs in front of a voting station that's kind of what their vision was from what I could see of, of what they were trying where they were trying to establish with this with this uh, procedure so I think we are now at the uh, kind of the in review part and which will be followed by the questions so uh, in review you're subject to the, your you know you'll be running for a municipality you're subject to the provisions of the municipal government act municipal government act where municipalities are creature of a, pro of a province with the illusion of autonomy Sometimes that illusion is pretty strong, but other times it's not. We are still subject to their legislation and their rules. And they change all the time, as we know, from the ad nauseum three years of changes to the Municipal Government Act, three acts, a whole pile of, I can't remember how many it is, dozens of regulations uh, that are being changed and have been changed, and all of it in various states of completeness. So uh, we do have a level of autonomy, but it's the level of autonomy that's dictated to us by the province. So we have to adhere to their rules for these things. Uh, councilors' roles and duties are, are, are restricted. Uh, it's not a matter of being able to just uh, 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 sort of do what do do what you want wherever you want, however you want it. There's a framework that it works within, and there's a division of duties. Uh, the classic rowing versus steering analogy is often used, where the council steers the boat and the administration votes. So. so Sometimes they'll, they'll change the course, and then we'll roll towards that one. Sometimes we want to say roll faster, and at some point your CAO might say that's as fast as they can roll, sir. I can't do it anymore. That'll you know, like Scotty from from Star Trek. Okay. Sort of sort of dating myself there a little bit. Um, the council time commitment and remuneration. Uh, so we went over that. The time commitment is highly dependent on which committees you're on and what level of involvement you want with it. Uh, to call it a part-time job is probably fair. To call it a full-time job, I would suggest that for most cases it probably wouldn't be. Um, the mayor's job is probably closer to that. Uh, and because everybody wants a piece of the mayor, the mayor ends up going to a lot of engagements and things and such. But the mayor's powers are far more informal than formal. Formally speaking, if you're on the council table, one vote like the rest of the members of council, with the additional burden of having to chair, unless you have a bylaw that says otherwise, and uh, it actually in some ways restricts the the, the mayor and it tends to be a little bit more the sort of uh, peacemaker confidant and have worked a little bit more on an informal level with the other members of council. Uh, as we as we mentioned, there's uh, pecuniary pecuniary interest guidelines that uh, are provisions that require you to follow. Uh, for the most part, they're fairly permissive. There's a lot of things you can do as long as you do it right. Make sure you follow the, the rules. Yeah, opt out when you need to. The rule of thumb is that you are better off to err on the side of caution than you are to err on the side of voting on something that you shouldn't have. There has never been, because there's a requirement to vote on every issue unless you're allowed to, or permitted to abstain. And there has not once ever in the province of Alberta been a challenge based on the fact that somebody excused themselves from an item because they thought they had a pecuniary interest and they were subsequently proven not to have one. They have, there's never been a disqualification because of that. So it's, it can be, it's a pretty safe bet to err on the side of caution about that one. Uh, eligibility, make sure you read those sections very carefully. All the sections that are inside the package, make sure you read those carefully before you submit. Make sure that you're uh, getting uh, nominators that are uh, uh, electors of the municipality. Uh, get many extras if you like. In fact, it's a good idea. Make sure that when you hand your papers in, you've got your cash uh, or whatever form of liquid payment that you can do because you can't take the check. Don't forget about the uh, cause it all together. I have seen that happen where one person went in and said, I don't have any money. And the next guy said to them, here's 100 bucks. Because that, that was the fee of that particular one, and then that person was forever, and that other person's paid, but that's another story. So uh, don't forget about that part of it. Uh, don't forget that if you're not going to be there in person, you have to get it signed in front of a commissioner, 
And for goodness sakes, please don't forget about your four and three A's. Remember, it doesn't cover just uh, just cash. It also covers gifts in kind. Uh, remember, we mentioned about the uh, about the having to have a separate bank account if the aggregate amount of it comes up to more than five thousand dollars between contributions from yourself and others. I think more or less is what it says. And uh, make sure you understand that you meet the eligibility requirements and uh, make sure that you're following the sign uh, the sign bylaws and, and such. Yes. You have to disclose the source. What is on that form 21? Let's take a look. So, eleven, three, and four. Let's oh, I'll take this. Okay, one forty seven. So, I'll just read those sections off. <laughs> now, what it says under this particular section, I'll read the other ones as well. Uh, file a disclosure statement with the municipality listing the campaign expenses incurred during the candidate's election campaign. Does it say anything about the sources here? Um, three says that you have to have that account if you have over the five thousand. Uh, it should only be used to pay campaign expenses. Uh, talks about real property, personal property, and services are valued. Receipts are issued for every contribution obtained for every expense. You know. Because you have to provide that, somebody could divide it from that, right? Um, yeah, they could. It's possible. And you should get one. You should. So that you have to keep it for two years. Uh, proper directions given to the candidate's official agent and any other person who's authorized to incur campaign expenses. Uh, on behalf of the candidate, so there they do mention they don't. It's funny they say they do these for the or, or whatever they're assigned, and then uh, it, it mentions there specifically about the agent because I think there's a contemplation that it could be an agent uh, doing it. So, uh, an anonymous campaign contribution or campaign contribution, not return contribution. Oh, okay, so. It's also got a provision here I'm going to read that says candidate shall ensure that an anonymous campaign contribution or a campaign contribution not returned to the contributor under clause I, I'll read I in a second, is paid to the secretary for the municipality in which the election is held. And I, it says a campaign, a campaign contribution received in contravention of this act is returned to the contributor as soon as possible after the candidate becomes aware of the contravention. So you have to, if you accidentally go over your back schools, there's a thing you have to do with that. Uh, Jacqueline, could you see uh, what uh, oh, you want? Okay. Oh, hello. You just want back in. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. And that's basically all it says. You know, it, it doesn't point blank say that you have to see the source, except that if you have to head in receipts. That might functionally provide that information, is what I would think about. So, I think at this point we'll just take any further questions uh, that you might have regarding the process, regarding anything that we've covered today. Either Dave or myself. If you run for school board trustee and also for city council, which I'll get to. If the schedules overlap, what happens? 
like, well, like there are. I don't know the school act really well for, for yeah. regards to that, but I can tell you. Uh, the, I can tell you this from the point of view of the municipal government act. There's a requirement to make regular council meetings, and that if you're absent without permission for all the council meetings within an eight-week uh, time period that you become disqualified from the council. So you have to be cognizant of that. It's pretty hard to lose your, to become disqualified on that basis, but theoretically it can happen. Uh, I think, I guess in that case, I've certainly seen it before where there's somebody that's a member of both. That's not certainly not unheard of. Uh, how you juggle that uh, is kind of your problem. But I would suggest that if you've got conflicting meetings, this is something you may wish to have a bit of a heart to heart with with your two bodies to see if there's some way you can work around that. Council, so uh, just on the note of council meetings, if I could. So just on the note of council meetings, if I could. The schedule we have right now for council meetings is meaningless when the new council comes in. They can choose to keep that schedule or go with a completely different one. The frequency of meetings, how many they wish to have, what times of day they wish to have, if they want them at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, that's all up for grabs where the council has an organizational meeting. Currently we have our current schedule where we have meetings at 4 o'clock on 2nd and 4th of Mondays of the month, except for the Mondays of holiday, in which case it happens on the next business day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the new council coming in, will be it'll be entirely incumbent upon them to set whatever schedule they deem is appropriate in order to conduct the business. So I just thought I'd throw that a little bit in while I thought of it. Is it currently a council correspondent? Yes. Yeah. So. I'll just add to that, that that can also be, that usually is altered with the new council as well as with, with their input. So it is something that's updated every four years. Yeah, it's like the but yeah. they also have the additional requirement of the offering of um, training for council members. Yeah, and certainly our intent is, is to, to have a full uh, gamut of, of uh, orientation and training available to the members of council. Um, it, you know, uh, uh, publicly there's been a number of members who have stated that they're not running for, for re-election. So uh, that means that we will certainly have some new members and new faces on council. And with there being new faces on council, the, that certainly heightens the, the, the necessity, the need for orientation. Although I would suggest that even for returning councillors, it's a valuable thing, a good re re refresher and that sort of thing. So the, the, the two components of, of that type of process are not only bringing you up to speed on current legislation and requirements, but also on the specifics of our particular organization. And that's something that we uh, intend to have uh, various members of our administrative staff speak to their areas, their departments, and, and provide that context to the, to the new council. So you're looking at doing an in-house rather than bringing somebody in? We're doing a hybrid. We're doing both. We're doing both. Yeah. We're, we're just for half a day. We have uh, a, a consulting firm coming in, an Alberta firm. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. How is it? Uh, it's out of strategic of, steps. Is that the right name? True. Have I got yeah, that right name? Strategic, strategic steps. Uh, and uh, they're they're uh, they're quite a, a, a known uh, entity. Uh, I note that they've penned quite a few things for municipal affairs on their behalf. Things like inspection reports and such. Yep. So there, I think they're, I think they're, they're judging from the roster that they have, and it seems to be a fairly skilled bunch from what I can tell. And to add to that, a uh, check with York and Saskatchewan, was the one that I talked to the city manager there, they were thrilled with the, the uh, result and what they offered. It's a type of uh, process where it's, it's not with the hammer, it's very collegial type of uh, approach for showing people how it works. I've seen both kinds of I've seen other ones where they're just kind of hammering you on the head and thou shalt not do this. That's, that doesn't work. Uh, to me it doesn't work. I don't think that's the right way to to try and uh, bring a council into uh, into being as far as working together and understanding things. So these ones are very very collegial in the way they put that approach. But as Lucy said, we're doing a hybrid so that we've got lots of experience to, that we can share answer questions, uh, not try and fill you full of all of the information from each department, just kind of give you a general scope, and then of course you'll learn more as you want to learn more. 
and, and as we go along. So you, you don't want to just overload people here. I'll, I'll tell you, if there's no more questions, I want to thank you for your interest first in running for council. It definitely is a, a very worthy endeavor. You should uh, feel a lot of pride in the effort that you put towards it because it, it really is something you can feel good about uh, serving your community. I certainly have looked back on the years that I was involved in and thought it was, it was time well spent, so I hope you do as well. But uh, I don't want to cut it off if there are any more nope. questions. That's very good. Do we have any donuts left? Check the donuts, check the coffee. Amanda and I had half of them already. <laughs> All right. So, and, and before?